Welcome back, everyone. Next up, we have Aileron Therapeutics, Inc. It trades on the NASDAQ under the symbol ALRN and is a clinical stage chemo protection oncology company focused on fundamentally transforming the experience of chemotherapy for cancer patients. Please welcome its CEO, Manuel Evado. Welcome, Manuel. Thank you, Anna. Uh, thanks for the invite. Pleasure to be here. Um, as Anna said, uh, my name is Manuel Ivado, and I'm the president and CEO of Aileron Therapeutics. By background, I'm a medical oncologist uh, with 25 years experience in treating patients as well as developing drugs in the drug developing industry. In the coming presentation, I will be making forward-looking statements as stated here on the slide that can be found on our website. And if I had to summarize the entire story of our company in one slide, this would be the slide. What we do at Aileron is that we aspire to transform chemotherapy. We want to make chemotherapy a well-tolerated therapy that can therefore become a more effective therapy that can therefore save more lives. And we have demonstrated the effectiveness of our drug in a recent proof of concept trial where we were able to show triple play activity. We were able to reduce the frequency of side effects known as neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, and anemia. We'll get into that in greater detail in a little bit. The approach that we use here has the potential to protect against a variety of different toxicities, not only the ones that you see here, but anybody who has seen a beloved one, a friend or family member undergoing chemotherapy has witnessed firsthand the variety of different side effects that our patients are unfortunately subjected to when they are treated with chemotherapy. So we'll get into that in greater detail in a little bit. We are not the only drug, um, obviously, that is designed to treat these chemotherapy-induced toxicities. There's a whole industry, a multi-billion dollar industry of, of different compounds trying to achieve that. But we are unique in that we are the only ones who are, for the first time ever, out there with a well-defined patient population using a biomarker that enables us upfront to selectively define who the patients are that we can treat in the most safe and effective manner, as I'll explain a little bit. But this patient population is characterized by a specific mutation. The mutation is called P53. And we're talking about nearly 1 million cancer patients in the US who are diagnosed on an annual basis with such a cancer who has a P53 53 mutation. So that's the market potential that we will be talking about. The study, uh, the trial, uh, the company is in, in phase one slash two trials. While we speak, we have just announced this morning a second chemo protection trial that will soon be starting, but we are already underway with a double blind placebo controlled randomized trial in non small cell lung cancer, a trial that has two key value inflection points uh, ahead in this year, 2022. We have interim results coming up in the second quarter and top line results from this study coming up at the end of this year. And as of this morning, we announced that we're now also starting a breast cancer trial. And that trial will be uh, taking place in patients who undergo neoadjuvant chemotherapy and interim results from this trial can also be expected as early as in the fourth quarter of this year. So a very exciting 2022 in front of us, no doubt. And the ultimate goal, the ultimate vision for the company, the reason why we get out of bed in the morning is to develop this medicine in a way that we make this available to patients who have a P53 mutated cancer, those patients who require chemotherapy, who will be kept from living a normal life, from getting out of bed, taking the kids to school, running errands, going jogging, taking the dog out for a walk. We stand to change that. The goal is to transform chemotherapy regardless of what cancer, regardless of what chemotherapy. And basically, in a nutshell, we want to turn chemotherapy from a toxic therapy to a tolerated therapy. Now, before we explain how that's going to happen, let me quickly take a step back and emphasize 
um, for anybody who might not have, have seen chemotherapy lately in action, um, what we're really talking about, and the magnitude of the problem that we're facing here, because chemotherapy remains the backbone of treatment for cancer patients, no matter how much we adore these alternative options that we are now being given, whether it's the immune therapies, the targeted therapies, monoclonal antibodies. Yes, those are great tools, but we still see a lot of those agents requiring before or later chemotherapy. Very often they get combined with chemotherapy, for instance, the immune checkpoint inhibitors. We thought that uh, they would revolutionize cancer therapy. Certainly they did, but lo and behold, we're back to now combining them all with chemotherapy. So chemotherapy, whether we hate it or not, isn't going away anytime soon. Yet it comes at a high price. Uh, the side effects are massive. They affect millions of cancer patients worldwide. And the problem, the problem for those side effects lies in the fact that chemotherapy cannot distinguish between friend and foe. Chemotherapy is unselective. It will kill cancer cells and healthy cells likewise. And that unselective killing of cells is what causes those side effects. Now, what do we have to to offer to, to counter those side effects. And as you might know from, from people in, 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 in your close circle who have gone through this, there isn't a lot we have to offer. Uh, in fact, very often we resign to these side effects. We are told that this is gonna go away, it's a certain amount of time, it's what it is, and we'll get through this. And then the hell begins for, for many of these patients and the side effects um, transform the way they eat, the way they, they live their daily lives, the way they look, for instance. Now, there are drugs that are designed to help those patients um, to, to mitigate some of these toxicities. Many of these drugs have a lot of limitations. Uh, some of these drugs um, don't work that well. There are side effects for, their, for which there is no treatment whatsoever. Um, so there's a huge unmet medical need when it comes to this problem of chemotherapy-induced toxicities. <clears throat> And to go a little bit more in detail what those toxicities look like, we can roughly separate those toxicities into two categories. On the left side of the slide here, you see the toxicities that affect our bone marrow, toxicities that manifest in our blood, in our blood cells, to be precise. We see patients with anemia, which means they lack red blood cells. We see patients who lack platelets and therefore um, suffer from, from bleeding, um, a circumstance called thrombocytopenia. We see patients who lack white blood cells, something called neutropenia, and patients then develop uh, infections that very often can be very life-threatening and uh, not really can be fatal. And then there are all these other side effects outside of our bone marrow, and side effects that cause us to lose our hair, side effects that cause us to feel pain in our mouth, to be unable to eat, we'll have fatigue, diarrhea, stomatitis, and... Um, fatigue, and so on and so on. The list is very, very long. And it's not surprising. It is not surprising to hear that any of these side effects or a combination thereof will very often cause patients to require a dose reduction in their chemotherapy, a delay in the next cycle of chemotherapy, very often both. And of course, the less chemotherapy we give to these patients, the more we delay treatment, the lower the chances of chemotherapy to make a real difference for these patients and for their prognosis. And so again, we stand to change that. By avoiding many of these toxicities, we should be able to avoid those delays and those reductions and therefore give patients a better chance to complete their chemotherapy and have greater benefit from chemotherapy as they go through their treatment. Now, as I mentioned, there's a whole industry dedicated to treating these side effects, but there are a lot of limitations. And I'm just highlighting here the, 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 the three biggest buckets um, as it relates to the bone marrow toxicities. Otherwise, it would take too much time to go into all the details. But um, let's start with anemia. This is a multi-billion dollar industry uh, of drugs um, that belong into the category called erythropoietin, short EPO. Um, that are being prescribed to these patients. It used to be a $4 billion market in oncology. It's down to $1 billion now. Why is that? Well, it, the problem didn't go away, but the issues with EPO are just enormous. As you see here, there's a black box warning for EPO drugs, 
And this black box warning is very serious because it says that patients who have cancer and receive EPO, EPO might stimulate the growth of their tumor cells. And as you can imagine, that makes a lot of hematologists and oncologists shy away from using erythropoietin. And uh, this was uh, something that came out of randomized control trials that caused the FDA, that forced the FDA to impose a black box warning on EPO. And that is why the the original um, uh, amount of sales with EPO drugs in oncology melted down from 4 billion to 1 billion. So the medical problem is still there, but there is no longer a safe drug that can be given to many of these patients to combat anemia. Um, the other side effects that I, I'm not going to belabor in the interest of time, let's rather move on to neutropenia, severe neutropenia, a huge problem for many cancer patients. And again, the multi-billion dollar industry of compounds that belong into the category of GCSF um, that stands to help these patients with neutropenia. The problem is that GCSF also is suspected of occasionally promoting the growth of cancer cells, aside from causing bone pain, causing splenic rupture occasionally, and simply not working in some patients. And then for things like low platelet counts, there is no drug that is commonly used. There's nothing really safe that can be given. Transfusions, blood transfusions, platelet transfusions to be specific, is the only thing that really can be done. And Platelet transfusions last two to three, four, five days maximum. So this is not a very satisfactory solution for any oncologist treating his or her cancer patients. So with all this in mind, we have created a fundamentally different approach, an approach where we stand to not come in and correct the damage after the, da the damage has happened, but a unique new approach where we come in and prevent the damage before it happens in the first place. And this is a completely novel paradigm. Coming in, giving a medicine before chemotherapy that will protect healthy normal cells from chemo so that the damage doesn't happen. Now, that sounds like a very attractive idea until you realize, wait a second, how do you make sure that that medicine will not also protect cancer cells from chemotherapy. And this is a critical um, concern with a lot of drugs that came before us that tried to do what we are trying to do here. And let me illustrate with a slide here what I mean and how this works. So in a patient with cancer, you have cells that are highly replicating, and these are commonly your cancer cells. That's why the tumor grows, because the cells are growing, they're replicating. And you have healthy cells that need to replicate on an ongoing basis in our bone marrow, in our hair follicles, in our, our gut. Uh, there's plenty of cell renewal happening every single day. And these healthy cells are going through a process pretty much like the cancer cells, that is the cell cycle. What if you could arrest the cell cycle only in cancer cells without arresting the cell cycle in healthy cells? That would be the holy grail. That would be an opportunity to shield the healthy cells from chemotherapy while not shielding cancer cells from chemotherapy. And that's exactly what we have created here. Uh, an approach, a therapy that temporarily can shield the healthy cells from chemotherapy without shielding cancer cells from chemotherapy. So let me show you how that works in, in simple terms in the clinic. The treatment is reserved for patients with a P53 mutated cancer, and that represents about a million cancer patients in the U.S. on an annual basis. Those patients will receive, as illustrated here, will receive our drug ALRN6924 prior to chemotherapy. Our drug is a one-hour infusion that can conveniently be given to patients as an outpatient, and then our drug goes to work. It activates a process that starts with P53 in healthy cells, and it can only work in healthy cells the way the drug is designed. And then P53 will arrest through P21 a state of, of cell cycle um, arrest that then means that the healthy cells are no longer vulnerable. They're no longer susceptible to chemotherapy. And now, now we can administer chemotherapy safely um, and chemotherapy will now unfold its attack on the cancer cells that are P53 mutated 
without um, attacking the healthy cells in our body. We have created a regulatory uh, drug development strategy here that I'd like to highlight on this slide here where we put this mechanism to work. Uh, we have demonstrated the mechanism of action. We have demonstrated our proof of concept in a recent study in patients with a cancer called small cell lung cancer, uh, short abbreviated small SCLC shown on the left side of the slide here. We are currently conducting a double-blind placebo-controlled randomized trial in patients with non-small cell lung cancer. That's the green bucket here on the slide. And those patients are patients who undergo frontline chemotherapy. And uh, this is a trial that I mentioned a few minutes ago that has two readouts coming up this year, interim results in the second quarter, top-line results from 60 patients by the end of this year. This trial is then going to be followed with a second randomized trial and as such creates the, 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 the basis or the backbone for an approval by the agency for patients with non-small cell lung cancer. And hopefully later in Q&A, we can go into greater details, um, but the strategy really is with very few trials to get to a broad label where this drug will be given to any cancer for any chemotherapy as long as the cancer is P53 mutated. And then as we announced this morning, we're starting a patient, uh, trial in, in breast cancer patients um, with a readout with interim data by the end of this year. Uh, here, patients will be given a highly toxic chemotherapy known as doxorubicin, cyclophosphamide, and docetaxel, and um, another area of high unmet medical need that we're very excited about. Uh, for instance, within two cycles, within two cycles only, these patients will completely lose their hair inevitably. And as such, it gives us an opportunity to test not only whether we see, once again, the protection we saw previously as it relates to bone marrow toxicities, but also whether we see protection against hair loss. And then, of course, um, there's plenty of other chemotherapies and cancers that we can test uh, in order to further um, support um, the, the database of, of knowledge that treating physicians will require, um, something that we can discuss maybe in Q&A. Let me go back to the beginning and highlight the proof of concept that we uh, were able to present uh, in, in a variety of different scientific presentations. Uh, the last one was ESMO last year. Uh, we presented data in patients receiving topotecan, a very, very toxic chemotherapy. And um, shown here is data from two different trials. In gray, you see a historical trial that we, we use as a comparator, where you see patients who got treated with chemotherapy uh, plus placebo. And you see in these dark gray bars across the board um, how frequent these patients suffer from a variety of different toxicities. And then in that trial, Patients were also given the same chemotherapy with a drug that is aspiring to do something similar to what we are doing here, a drug called Cozella. And this drug got actually approved by the FDA early 2021. And as you see here, the drug had activity in a variety of different toxicities, such as grade 4 neutropenia in the left upper corner, febrile neutropenia, some activity against anemia, but then really little to no activity as it relates to thrombocytopenia or transfusions, whether it's red blood cells or platelets, uh, there was really no activity whatsoever. Now in blue, you see the performance of our drug and you see easily how we were able to significantly reduce all of these toxicities uh, from what you would have commonly expected with chemotherapy alone. But even if you gave patients this other drug, Cozella, you see that our drug is significantly more promising, more powerful in terms of of containing those toxicities. And so we're very excited about this result. And that begs the question, so then where are you going next and uh, where can we go next? Um, and so with that, let's quickly look at the um, market potential. Uh, you see here a couple of cancer types, uh, representative cancer types. Uh, obviously, this x-axis can be filled with 200 different cancer types. We look for those patients with P53 mutated cancer. And the message of the slide basically is to show that you find those patients with P53 
mutated disease in any cancer type. You see here half of the breast cancer patient population will have that biomarker. About half of the lung cancer patients will have that biomarker. Most patients with colorectal will have that biomarker, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This list goes on. You can add another 200 cancers, and you'll continue to see that there's always a proportion of patients who are diagnosed with P53 mutated disease. And so as such, for us, the market potential is about half of this number here, the 1.8 million in the US, that's the total number of patients being di diagnosed per year. About uh, a million of these patients will qualify uh, if treated with chemotherapy, should qualify for treatment with our drug. And worldwide, uh, it, these numbers are staggering, obviously, as you can imagine. And 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 even from a commercial standpoint, um, certainly too early to talk too much about, about commercial considerations here, but uh, take a drug like GCSF that is commonly used in these patients. GCSF um, is, is currently priced generally with $4,000 per cycle. Most cancer patients will receive six or more cycles of treatment. So for a drug like ours, if we were uh, to price our drug like GCSF, um, and, and that would be quite uh, um, surprising probably to many since our drug can do so much more than GCSF, uh, but you're looking at $24,000 per patient. Um, given this market potential, you see how enormous the opportunity is um, for us here in terms of how many patients we can benefit and the commercial value thereof. Um, let me quickly highlight the ongoing study. Um, this is not the one that we announced this morning that we are starting, uh, that is breast cancer. This one is the one that is already ongoing, and this is uh, a double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized trial. As such, it uh, uh, deserves a little bit more attention. It's a trial in which patients with lung cancer will be treated with frontline chemotherapy. They come in on one day to get our drug, 6 and to 4, or if they're randomized to placebo, they get a placebo infusion. The next day, they get chemo. But before chemo, we give them, again, 6 and to 4 in order to make sure that we maximize the number of healthy cells that are completely arrested, that are protected from chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is a certain amount of half-life. We want to account for that by adding another infusion one day afterwards. And uh, with this design, we expect that we will be able to see uh, later this year evidence that we can protect patients from a variety of different toxicities, as I stated earlier. Um, we have a very, very strong patent uh, um, portfolio um, under our belt. We have more than 170 um, different patents uh, issued to us in the US and in other jurisdictions. Um, we added a bunch of additional patents uh, just as of last year, one in particular very important to us that is in China, uh, that strengthens our position in China and as such um, uh, elevates our, our options for interesting, lucrative um, regional license agreements with Chinese partners. Um, as an option for non-dilutive financing. We do retain, as you see at the bottom of the slide here, we do retain global exclusive rights, not only to our drug, but to the underlying technology. Um, and uh, we think that uh, a drug should be partnered when the data is there to really demonstrate the value of the drug, and not too early when you give away just too much value for too little in return. But we're very, very proud of our patent state here as stated, and uh, we're very good protection. Uh, composition of matter alone should go into 2038 with the usual and customary patent um, term extensions that we can expect um, to, to be given um, in addition to a plethora of additional patents with uh, even longer expiration dates. Uh, from a financial standpoint, um, we closed um, the third quarter uh, with $52 million uh, in the bank. We generally burn about around three and a half to $4 million a quarter. Um, the current balance sheet uh, we, is expected to support our operations into uh, late second half of next year. So we're in a good cash position right now. Um, we have 90.6 million shares outstanding and we're currently being covered by a variety of different banks uh, listed here at the bottom of the slide. So to wrap up this presentation, we live, we exist to transform chemotherapy, to make chemotherapy a therapy that is well tolerated, that allows patients to continue to live a normal life. And in doing so, not only do we save those lives that can be saved by avoiding fatal toxicities, but also we can improve the efficacy of chemotherapy. And that also should translate into more lives saved. 
We achieve this through selective chemoprotection, which means we protect normal cells without protecting cancer cells. We have demonstrated this looking at hematologic toxicities, looking at blood transfusions, as I just showed you a few slides ago, and we have the potential to protect against multiple other toxicities, something that we um, expect to be able to demonstrate from the ongoing studies in lung cancer and breast cancer later this year. Uh, the readouts um, you saw earlier, second quarter and fourth quarter, uh, with the breast cancer trial being just announced this morning and starting uh, in the next couple of uh, a few months ahead of us. And so really the goal, again, is ultimately not just to get a label in lung cancer or breast cancer. The goal really is ultimately to get this approved and available to patients with P53 mutated cancers, regardless of their cancer, regardless chemotherapy. So with this, I conclude my presentation. Thanks for the attention. And if there's time for questions, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Yeah, there are lots of questions. We got a little bit of time for you. Thank you so much. Um, question from um, Elisa Gibb. Do you know if you are currently positioned in any ETFs? Um, yes, uh, there are a couple of ETFs that we have been included in. Um, I would have to look up which ones they are, um, and maybe there's a way how we can uh, connect offline. If you can reach out through our website, uh, there is an uh, investor contact button. Uh, we'll be able to provide that information to you. Okay, thank you. Kathy G wants to know more about your trials. Are you doing any overseas or just in the U.S.? Uh, both. Um, we're actually fairly international. Um, we in the lung cancer trial, we are currently uh, actually we just announced this morning that we have enrolled our first 10 patients in our lung cancer trial. Very proud of that. And um, we are um, currently screening in five different countries in Europe and in the US. In fact, we have enrolled patients in Europe and in the US. And we intend to do the same thing for the breast cancer trial. We'll have sites in Central Europe, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, as well as in the US. So we want to keep this as broad as possible since we want to move quickly uh, next year, later next year, into a pivotal trial. And then having a broad footprint in different countries with a good amount of sites helps you to um, start that trial much, much faster. Hence why we are positioning ourselves a little bit broader at this stage. Chris Ford wants to know if you currently have any joint ventures with any other major pharma companies. Yeah, we have not. Uh, we had plenty of opportunities to uh, engage in such type of partnerships in the last two years. Um, and really, this journey of chemo protection is, is, believe it or not, really only two years old. Um, mm. And uh, again, we believe that if we partner too early, it's too much uh, asset dilution. We think that we get much more recognition, much more value in return if we hold on to our rights uh, a little bit longer. And I think with 2022 and its data readouts, I think we'll be in a good position to revisit a couple of offers. Uh, we think that we're going to see a couple of really interesting offers down the road for us as it relates to um, strategic partnerships. Great. Um, what Shane Atkins says, when you say transform chemo from toxic to tolerable, what percentage of tolerable chemos are being used today? That's a great question, um, and not one that I, I can answer, um, even though I'm an oncologist by, by training. The problem with, with chemotherapy is that, um, first, they all get combined. Not all, but many of them get combined with other chemotherapies. And so what's reasonably well tolerated, let's take pemetrexate, for instance. Uh, if given alone, pemetrexate is relatively well tolerated, really well, relatively well tolerated, but combined with carboplatinum, it immediately turns into a very toxic cocktail. Um, there are therapies that are extremely well tolerated. Let's take capecitabine, for instance. But if given in last line, which is where it's given in most cases, it's actually very toxic because those patients are just beaten up from multiple lines of therapy. So I wish I would be able to give a good answer to that question. Uh, I cannot. What I can say is that even very healthy patients in, in very good constitution, and uh, I'm sure many of you in the audience have seen that happening, um, People who start out very strong and healthy, uh, facing chemotherapeutic toxicities, it all changes how these people live. Granted, not everybody is going to die from these toxicities, but even those who are strong and healthy at the outset will suffer toxicities. It's just a matter how many toxicities and how long do they last and how much can we do about those toxicities.
Sure. Thank you for that question and answer. Lou Tyson wants to know, he says, you already addressed your capital structure, but can you branch into when you think you should be cash flow positive? And lastly, do you currently have a private placement registered now that one can invest in? Um, so let's start with the first question. Um, we um, think that we can go into registration trials starting as early as next year, second half of next year. We think that those registration trials, given the big effect size that we have seen in our, in our last clinical trial, that such a pivotal trial could be a relatively small trial, maybe in the ballpark of no more than 200 patients. And such a trial could read out very quickly because these toxicities happen very quickly. And so we, unlike many others who run cancer trials, we don't need to wait for one, two, three years until PFS and OS is read out. The toxicities happen instantly, so the readout is very fast. So it's going to be a relatively small study that we can start next year with very quick readouts. We think that a potential approval for our drug is conceivable as early as 2025, first half of 2025. Um, as it then relates to becoming uh, um, ca cash neutral um, or starting to create some revenue, uh, that will depend on on things like, like the, the speed of launch. Um, I wouldn't want to speculate about that, but I think that gives some some orientation as to the trajectory of cash burn and uh, revenue creation. Um, the last question was about um, about whether we have a uh, an ATM in place. Uh, we have uh, an at the market um, facility in place. Um, through uh, our um, banks, uh, William Blair and Jones Trading. This is public knowledge, uh, publicly available. Um, uh, those banks, we have an ATM with those banks, yes. Uh, we don't like to use it. Uh, and in fact, we have rarely used it. Um, I know some companies like to use it to drivel out constantly, stock into the market. Uh, that's not what we do. We use it very strategically. Uh, if a marquee investor comes along and wants to take a position, um, we think it's good financial hygiene to have such a tool in place. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, Anita Pham says she loves what you're doing. How much R&D in terms of time and dollars have gone into your technology? Uh, it's a great question. Um, I don't have a good answer off the cuff, and I don't want to invent one. What I can say is that the company has existed since 2006, and this was a very, very long journey, like many, many breakthroughs uh, that took 10 plus years in order to really um, break through and start to shine, right? Uh, the company was founded 2006 and it was completely dedicated to this technology that we are now taking advantage of. So we're one of the few biotechs that even 10, 15 years later is still dedicated to the very reason that it was founded for. Um, and uh, as such, I can tell you that we have spent uh, well over $20 million on patents alone, for instance, and uh, um, certainly a, a much bigger number uh, than that on, on R&D since the, the inception of the company. Uh, we only went public in 2017. So you see that there's 11 years prior to going public of, of grinding and discovering this technology, developing this technology. It's a peptide drug. Um, in case somebody wonders in the audience, what is he talking about? What do you mean by technology? Uh, we didn't go into the details here, but it's a peptide drug, which is part of the reason why we think it's so well tolerated and why we can actually use it, um, uh, the peptide to do what, what we're doing here. And um, it is a platform in and on itself that lends itself to the same that we do with monoclonal antibodies. In other words, you can create multiple uh, of these peptides, like the one we're currently using in the clinic, you can create multiple of those peptides and go after multiple of those targets intracellularly, something that was the reason for the foundation of this company. But I can't give you an exact number how much we have spent over the life of this company in terms of uh, R&D costs. Thank you for that. So uh, Zach Kaufman says, I noticed your market cap has been on a slide since February 2021. This seems to be the trend of all biotechs. Is there anything besides being pulled down with the rest of the space that shareholders should be concerned of? You know, that's a great point, actually, and, and a very frustrating one for us. I mean, we we have presented more data than we had announced a year ago that we would present. Uh, we have very elegant preclinical data. Uh, we have we don't have a single negative trial readout. There was there was not a single uh, outcome that was presented or reported that didn't go according to plan. And so for us, it has been very frustrating, um, as it has been, I'm sure, for everybody who is an existing shareholder in ours. And we take some comfort in the fact that we are in good company, looking at our peers 
uh, and comps in the industry and how their um, stock performance has been pretty much in line with ours. Uh, but we don't like to look for excuses. Um, I think I do want to rather point out that it does remain um, an, an enormous challenge for us to make people understand what this is about. I mean, the journey only for chemo protection, for what we are doing today as a company, that journey only started two years ago. I took over as CEO three years ago, and uh, then we embarked on this journey. And since then, we have been trying to communicate this the best we can. And uh, I think we're making progress. When I took over, the market cap was $35 million. Um, early last year, we were almost at $200 million. So I think there was a lot of negative sentiment that worked against us. And uh, certainly, um, the fact that all our value inflection points are in 2022 didn't help with stock performance in 2021. As we're now in 2022, we're excited about the fact that we have three value inflection points, three data readouts this year, and therefore we are optimistic that we see a much better stock performance uh, this year. Um, and then I think the last thing I want to say is that, you know, whenever you have something that is so fundamental in nature that can transform really how we how we how we used to proceed, how we used to operate, there's a lot of reservation, right? There, there was a lot of reservation about the immune therapies when they started. There was a lot of reservation about the checkpoint inhibitors, the CDK4-6 inhibitors, et cetera, et cetera, uh, the CAR-T cell therapies, and so on and so forth. And so in this case, people look at us and they go, wow, the market cap is so little, yet your market potential is multiple billions of dollars. That's such a big discrepancy. It actually works against you uh, because it sounds too good to be true. And our job, my job, is to go out and talk to as many people as possible, make them understand that there are no, no tricks here. There is no voodoo. It's very straightforward. We treat healthy normal cells. We protect them from chemo. Chemo can be given without the side effects that you normally encounter. And that will help patients. And uh, patients will love it. Physicians will love it. And payers the payers will love it, of course, because I think the healthcare system will, will stand to, to benefit greatly from, from a drug like this. So I think there's a lot of ingredients that, that play a role here. But again, I, I hate to make excuses for our poor stock performance, and uh, we'll do everything we can to have a great 2022. Good. Just a few more questions for you from Art Wagstaff wants to know what percentage of patients have the P53 mutation? Yeah, excellent point. Um, it probably got lost um, as I was rushing through the presentation, but it's a little bit over 50% of all cancer patients in the U.S. That's about almost a million patients in the U.S. per year. Now, dependent on what cancer type, uh, the numbers differ very quickly. So there's subtypes of lung cancer where it's 75%. There's subtypes where it's only 25%, et cetera. Um, so ultimately, it depends on what type of cancer you're looking at. But across the board, it adds up to 50% of all cancer patients in the U.S. and 50% 50, 50 of all cancer patients worldwide. And last question from Paul Garner. Can you give us a timeline for initiation of phase 1B of ALRN6924 and the release of the readouts of the NSCLC trial results? Yeah, so we started the study, the non-small cell lung cancer study. We started in summer, summer last year, um, summer of uh, 2021. Uh, we have two readouts for NSCLC. One is going to be in the second quarter of this year. And the second readout with all 60 patients will be in the fourth quarter of this year. We have announced as of this morning a new trial in breast cancer. That trial has a readout, an interim readout in the fourth quarter of this year. So a total of three data readouts this year. Great. Well, good luck with this very important technology. Thank you so much for your time and wealth of knowledge. And please join us again on our conference with some updates. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna. It's a pleasure. Thanks so much. Goodbye, everybody. All right, everyone, stay with us. We're going to take a quick break, but we're back at 2 o'clock Eastern time. We've got some more great companies coming your way, so we'll see you all very soon.